Hey guys, welcome back to the shack. Tonight, we're gonna do a quick uh, project video. I promise you guys, this one will be fairly short. Not a lot to go over. But recently, Brandy was going through the internet as usual, finds a project idea and sends it to me and goes, hey, can you make that? And of course, my answer is, I'll try. And I have good news to report without a whole lot of testing, actually without any testing. I got lucky and found the right settings. And we have completed the project in which she had requested. Now, I told her when she bought these to please don't go get the most expensive ones because I had full intentions of I was gonna attempt this burn. If it didn't work, then I was gonna turn around and just use this as a tester and go from there. But I needed a sample of the material to test. So we ordered the smaller ones and it worked out nicely. So that's what we're gonna go over tonight, guys, is to show you how I was able to pull this off, believe it or not, first attempt. Yeah, I'm shocked too. But if you'll stick around, I'm gonna show you the process I used. And if you wanna attempt this yourself, then uh, I'll show you where to get the things you need to be able to pull this off. So stick around, we'll be right back. All right guys, so first off, Tonight when I got out here for this project, my intentions were to use the CO2 because I'm like, hey, CO2, you know, glass, shouldn't need a marking spray. But guys, uh, with the way that the CO2 that I have is built, getting the right distance, getting it to autofocus because it was seeing through the glass, all these things created problems. And after a few minutes of messing with it, I said, you know what? going back old school, we're gonna break out the diodes. Yes. So we ended up, of course, <laughs> in my task, built specifically tasks, enclosure of Enclosure Zilla. First step, of course, is gonna to be to get yourself a little Pyrex pan. Uh, I will put links down below to all this stuff if you're looking to get these or any of the other things that you'll be needing for this project, which is really just this and some of this. Now, before any of you say it, yes, you can use chalk paint, you can use this, you can use water paint, you can use airbrush, you can use, there's a, there's a thousand things you can use, guys. I don't. Yes, this stuff is very expensive, and this is the big can, so this is definitely not cheap. But I've tried all the other things. I like the results I get with this, I like the consistency I get with this, and I've gotten good at using it, and I don't want to change. <laughs> Unless somebody can send me something that works better. But... For now, this is what I use. You can use what you prefer, whatever you prefer, but if you don't get this kind of result, don't fuss at me. So we'll leave that there. But the first step is you're gonna wanna take your marking spray, whichever you decide to use, and you're gonna wanna take your Pyrex. And this is the second one that we're gonna do in this video. And you're gonna wanna make sure you get a good, even, thick coat. Uh, the way I do it is I do the first coat, right and left, I do the second coat the opposite direction. So you're gonna be basically on the, on the X axis, on the Y axis, and then the last coat I do is kind of a 45. And I do three moderate coats, nothing too thick. But you, what you don't want is when you hold it up to the light, you don't wanna be able to see through it really well. If you got a few little pinholes, no big deal. But you do not want to be able to see through it, see the light through the stuff. If you, if you can, you didn't put it on thick enough. So that's the first step. Prep your piece. Secondly, break it to the machine and I'm gonna show you how I set it up on mine. All right guys, so the ones of you that aren't familiar, this is my custom design brainchild marvel of engineering that I like to call Enclosure Zilla. And the reason that I like this enclosure is because this machine basically does all of my large items, no matter what it is, ammo cans, uh, stuff like this or whatever. And what makes it so unique and so well gifted for this is that the bed will simply lift up to the height that I need or lift down to accommodate taller items. And I've got about a foot of drop in this thing that I can use. So the first step guys is you don't want to be perfectly focused on glass from my experience. What you can end up happening is you can actually cause little tiny cracks and sometimes they're really noticeable and I have actually shattered glass objects while they're engraving. So you're going to want to make sure not to be in focus. 
you'll want to be high if possible. That way you don't have to worry about scraping. Because one problem that I had with the Lasermatic was there was a cable coming down from behind the uh, module that when I went to home the machine, it almost, luckily I caught it, but it almost scratched the top of the Cermark off. So you want to make sure that nothing's going to be hitting the top of this because that Cermark comes off really, really easy. But the way that I focus my machine, because I use my camera is focused to my usual work bed. So I don't move the module. I have these little tools that I made for my machine. And these tools, I got one for engrave and one for cut. And you'll notice it just kind of clips over the module there. And then I just move it over the workpiece. Well, for this particular job, I wanted about three millimeters of over exaggerated focus. And so all I got to do once I clip that on there is just grab my little button here and just kind of address the machine up using the button. And that lets me know that I am focused where I want to be. So once you get that set up, make sure you've got everything as square as you can possibly get it. And we're over to the computer to set the cut up. All right, guys, so over in Lightburn, and I've got the machine connected. This is the design I did on the uh, previous one that we had in there. And all I'm gonna do with this design here is I'm just gonna be changing the letter. And because I've got this lock, hang on. <laughs> Let me reinvert this so I can tell what I'm doing here. So I'm gonna flip this back around temporarily because it really messes with me when I'm using the text tool if I don't flip them around, because backspace is not actually backspace in that situation. So I'm gonna put an H on this one, uh, a little bit different design. Uh, I'm gonna have to do a little bit of retooling with the design to make sure that everything is not overlapping or, or whatever. Uh, this font may be a bit, let's see, wait a minute. I like that one a little better. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna hit the control button, select this guy, then this guy, center that up. These two little olive branches here are groups. So I'm gonna do the same thing with them just to make sure that everything is centered. Now, some characters, I will tell you the C, I actually had to back it over about two or three millimeters because even though it was technically centered, visually it was not appealing because the very back of the C's over here and the bottom, it looked a little too close to the right. So I chose to move it back just a little bit just to give it that visual centered look to the human eye. So once you get the graphics set up the way you want it, I strongly recommend grouping everything. That way nothing moves. Uh, this little tool line right here that I've got built is 150 millimeters wide and 100 millimeters tall. And there's a kind of a crease or like a border in the material that it's made out of that kind of lines up pretty well with this. And then once you get that in there, we're just going to frame that out. And I did find that since this last update, they've in Lightburn, even though I've got frame turned on, on my tool line, it does not frame the tool line here anymore. You have to use the circle frame tool. Again, this is like the second time that that's been the, uh, the case. So we're gonna hit the uh, frame, circle frame button here and frame this thing up and i'm going to take you over to the enclosure so you can kind of see what's going on over there but now before we get started guys the one thing that i do got to do which i don't guess i really got to on this one but we'll do it just to say is you gotta invert the image, which with an H, luckily it doesn't matter. So you don't even know really if it's <laughs> inverted or not. So we're just gonna leave that be. All right, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. This is the luckiest I've ever got at a strange material that I had never engraved. Uh, me and Brandy were sitting out here and I was trying to crank out my mind what I thought the settings needed to be with a 40 watt machine i've never done really any glass with a 40 watt just some mirrors and so i guessed at it and i guessed 80 millimeters per second at 100 percent output i'm setting it to feel of course and i set this as 300 but of course it's gonna bounce it down to 299.88 so 
that's the LPI that I'm running. Uh, bi-directional fill is on, and I'm not doing anything weird with the engraved lines because I like to, I'm a little OCD, and in the event that you can see the engraved lines, I like for them to run right to left or up and down. I don't like them at a 45-degree angle or anything like that. So uh, I do have it set to fill all shapes at once just to keep this file from being, uh, like, too broken up. Yes, if you wanted to break these up into three individual pieces, you might could get a little bit faster in grave speed because you would cut out all the white space. But it's really not a concern for me. I'll let this machine run while I'm doing another one. I want to keep my lines consistent all the way across. Uh, if you use flood fill or something, you're going to get some weird lines uh, in your engrave, and I'm not too sure that I would like them. And this is just one of those mediums to where I'm just going to stick with basics, and I want my lines evenly distributed all the way across the work area. So that's what we're going to be doing with this. And just because I'm paranoid, I'm going to frame one more time, guys. All right, that looks good. If I were doing a lot of these, just to let you guys know, I would be setting a jig. But I'm only doing two today. Uh, this is a, a Thanksgiving Christmas idea that Brandy came up with. And these might not even be the size that I end up really cranking out. So I'm just squaring them up, framing them, and uh, just doing it the old-fashioned way. So if you're wondering, you know, if you do have to have a jig, you don't have to. But if I were going to do 30 of these, 20 of these, I would definitely went through the trouble of making myself a little jig to go in there. But there we are. So for those that didn't catch it, 80 speed, 100% power, 299.88 on the LPI. Uh, make sure constant power is off and all that good stuff. So here we go. We're going to send it over to the machine and let it get started. And I'll check back with you in a little bit, guys, once it's uh, progressed. All right, guys, so after a few minutes, the design has completed. And one thing I want to show you guys and just kind of go over with you, before you move it, make sure that you had adequate power and speed. Now, the thing about using Cermark and, and clear items like this is for the most part, you're not going to be able to overburn them. So if you're ever in doubt, go ahead and run the pass again because it's only going to mark the material if there's adequate amount of Cermark on there. And if it did the job the first time, then chances are the second pass really isn't gonna do anything except maybe clean the engrave up. So if you are if you have any doubts, you can leave it sitting as long as you do like I do. My machine, when it completed the job, it just simply went back to the park position. It did not like go home or anything like that. So I can confidently send my machine back out and rerun that if I need it. But because this is the second one, I know that these settings are gonna be adequate. But I do wanna kinda of show you what it looks like when it gets through. That way, if you choose to do one of these, you'll have an idea of what to look for once it's completed. So for that, I'm gonna be using my extra little phone here uh, as a camera, and we're gonna get up real close and show you what it looks like. So one thing that you're gonna to need to be able to do this is I like using a flashlight, and you're gonna to wanna to just shine the flashlight and kind of look into the crevices and just make sure that the surmark has been pretty much removed. And you'll notice that it has. Uh, there's nowhere that the surmark hasn't been removed. That little fine powder right there that you see, that is basically just uh, the remnants of the surmark. But I've got nice clean lines. Uh, you can see that, that layer of surmark on there. So we should be good, guys. Uh, we definitely... Looks like we got enough right in the edge right there. I don't know if you can see it or not. Let me see if I can get my, let me see if I can zoom in. But if you look right in there, you can actually see the material. You can kind of see the frosting. So there we are on that. And, and that's the tail right there because I've run an air assist. So the air assist is pretty much going to blow off any kind of debris. And you've got a little bit of glass powder as well as the Ceramark you know, that's going to stain back this way as it moves. So that last little section right there, you can see it, it, it did a good job of frosting it. So let's get that thing out and get it cleaned up.
So the next step, guys, is pretty simple. Uh, once you're confident that your burn is the way that you want it, you just take that guy out of the uh, laser, take it to the water hose, the sink, wherever. Uh, you can use a bottle of water and a rag if you want. But uh, Surmark is water soluble, so it'll come off fairly easy with water. And uh, we're gonna go see what it looks like. So I'll be right back. All right, guys, so piece number two is complete. And to give this thing a little contrast so you guys can see it a little better, I'll put it up here on this piece of white canvas so you can kind of get a good look at what the back of it looks like here. So another great piece. And guys, I'll even, uh, I'll try to get a little better photograph of it and try to drop it up here for you so you can see the details and the way that it worked out. But the thing that I've been noticing with this stuff is if you notice that the glass itself has this kind of a blue shade to it. And when you do the engrave, it's kind of taking on that same color. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I was kind of thinking that maybe it would just be white frosted, uh, but the power and speed that I ran, I am getting a little bit of the Surmark is actually tinting the glass a little. And I didn't think I was gonna like that look, but I actually, I think it makes it pop a little better. So there you go, uh, easy project. This is uh, the smaller Pyrex and I will have a link down below. Like I said, I also have a link for this stuff uh, if you're interested in getting it. They sell a much smaller can if you wanna get you just a small one to do a few projects. The small cans, once you learn how to use the stuff and use it kind of sparingly, it actually goes a pretty good ways. Uh, this can I've had for a minute because I don't do that much glass. And like I said, I've learned how to just use just enough to get the job done effectively and not waste it because it is expensive. But, but yeah, guys, these, uh, I think these are gonna make some pretty good little, little gift ideas. Uh, also, uh, if you have, uh, let's say you have an organization, whether it be your church, whether it be uh, some type of nonprofit organization and you're having uh, some type of a, a serving where you're serving foods or stuff like that, you know, this would be something pretty cool. It adds that little unique pop to whatever you're using. Now, I will tell you, make sure and examine the pieces after you get them done and watch for any kind of cracks. If you see any cracks in there, uh, which with this thick glass and it being heat resistant glass, I don't think it's gonna be a problem, uh, but I am gonna have Brandy go ahead and heat these things up to the recommended temperature that they're made to operate at and just make sure when it does some expanding that it doesn't have a problem. I don't suspect it will, but it doesn't hurt to test it before you give it to somebody and they're cooking in it and it explodes. So <laughs> we're gonna do that, but being that the materials are made to be in the, uh, in the oven like that, I think we'll be good. But Another little idea for you guys, and if you're interested, like I said, check it out below and uh, grab you some blanks and have fun. It's only like six bucks a piece for these little small ones uh, to get you started. Uh, these would be awesome, like a little candy tray, something to decorate with. You know, there's countless, countless uses for this, and it's pretty cool. So I'm pretty sure Brandy's going to be bringing me some bigger ones. So if y'all have any questions or want to see some different designs, we may be doing some different designs in the future. But that's going to be it for today, guys. I uh, just wanted to make a quick video, share this with you guys because I thought it was kind of cool. And uh, if you like the video, be sure to hit the thumbs up. If you haven't already, subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications because you never know when you might miss another cool project that you could do for $6. And it's pretty cool. So till next time, guys, be safe and have a good day.